I'm here with Alexander Mercurius, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Alexander, we have some news now regarding A.G. Barr and uh, John Durham and their investigation into the Russiagate hoax. And the big news is that uh, it looks like Durham has uh, now turned the investigation into a criminal investigation. And this is uh, this is big for a variety of reasons, which you'll explain subpoenas, indictments, grand juries, you know, this is, some people should be shaking <laughs> and, and we'll, we'll mention the names of the people that should be shaking. But let me start out the video by reading you a couple of, uh, of excerpts from Zero Hedge and you can comment on them. And I quote, what began as an administrative review by the Justice Department into the origins of Russiagate has shifted to a criminal inquiry, according to the New York Times, citing two people familiar with the matter. The move will allow prosecutor John H. Durham the power to subpoena documents and witnesses to impanel a grand jury and to file criminal charges. Durham's progress has been closely monitored by Attorney General William Barr who appointed the veteran investigator in May, tasking him with looking into FBI and CIA intelligence gathering operations surrounding the 2016 U.S. election. As the Daily Caller's Chuck Ross notes, Barr said on April 10 that he believed spying had taken place against the Trump campaign and that he doesn't buy former FBI officials' version of how the collusion investigation began. We've been waiting for this. Here it is. We have indeed. Can I just say, first of all, that I, this is not a surprise to me. Um, I had thought this was the direction that events were taking. And the there was a very big clue a few days ago when there was information that several of the people who uh, we're going to be talking about, Brennan, Comey, all the rest, were busy appointing lawyers um, which strongly suggested to me that they've been receiving letters from the Justice Department informing them that they are suspects in a criminal investigation. So this is a huge event. Note that very properly and very appropriately, there has been no public declaration to this effect from the Justice Department. Investigations should be conducted in private until the point reaches comes when they result in uh, charges. One of the most outrageous things about Russiagate was the way in which, first of all, uh, uh, Comey, then, of course, the director of the FBI, came along to uh, Congress and basically disclosed the fact that there was an ongoing investigation. Though at that time, he pretended um, falsely, as it turned out, that it was just a counter espionage investigation. It was clearly intended to be more than that. And then, of course, that counter espionage investigation, which was never really a counter espionage investigation, was somehow transformed into a very public criminal inquisition headed by specially appointed special counsel Robert Mueller. And that, of course, created a huge upheaval across the entire political and legal system, which um, affected the United States for two years. Now, all of this is, to my mind, completely appropriate. There was another thing that pointed for me very much in the direction that we of, of events that we've just heard and that is that if you remember alex we did a video a few weeks ago about the fact that that william barr the attorney general of the united states and john durham who is his uh, um, assistant and who's the actual investigator in this case had traveled to rome and had met various people there and had apparently listened to some form of taped deposition provided by Joseph Mifsud. Mifsud being this extraordinary, mysterious, Maltese, so-called professor who played such a huge role in Russiagate, perhaps the central role in Russiagate, getting uh, um, uh, Papadopoulos, this young Trump campaign aide, set up and uh, um, in a way 
that supposedly triggered the start of the whole investigation. Now, the fact that Barr and Durham were prepared to travel all the way to Rome and to do it themselves and to obviously meet with people there rather than sending someone else to do it. You know, they have all kinds of investigators working for them. That strongly suggested to me that something very serious and very big is going on. I am not surprised by this. I would have been astonished knowing the history of Russia Gate and deeply concerned if this had not resulted in a criminal investigation. Because in my opinion, all the crimes, all the real crimes which were committed over the course of Russia Gate were committed not by the people who were being investigated, but by those who were investigating them. You've referred on many occasions, long before I started to do so, as Russiagate as a hoax. Russiagate was a hoax, and it was worse than a hoax. It was an attempted setup and a persecution of various innocent people, fundamentally innocent people, who were not in any way, uh, or should not have been in any way, subjected to an investigation. Even people like Paul Manafort, who in my opinion, committed serious crimes, they were not prosecuted in reality for those crimes, they were prosecuted because they got caught up in a political investigation that was not being conducted in good faith. And that is a much more serious matter than any of the crimes of which Paul Manafort was accused. Okay, great. So now we have a criminal investigation. Yeah. Yes, yes. A criminal investigation. Crim yes. Crimes were committed. Yes. So the big question is, who committed those crimes. Now I'm going to rattle off a bunch of names, Alexander, yep. and I want you to just freely discuss it. I'm just going to rattle off, rattle off some names. Choose to speak about whoever you want. Speak about them all. Here I go. Yes. Brennan. <laughs> James Clapper. Andrew McCabe. Hmm. James Comey. Hmm. Rod Rosenstein. Hillary Clinton, mm. Barack Obama, <laughs> Loretta Lynch, Susan Rice. I may have missed some well, people, but go ahead. You, you can even add if you, you want. Oh, well, I can add all sorts of other people. Why not Christopher Steele, for example? Because, I mean, you know, he's been involved in yeah, all kinds we, of things. We've done a lot of videos <laughs> on Steele. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Glenn Simpson. Right, and I've right. no doubt that there are all kinds of other people who we will no doubt catch up with. Um, I think you've identified the main names. I, I'm, I'm going to be very careful um, here in this video and not actually discuss the exact levels of culpability of these people in terms of criminal charges, because I think that would not be an appropriate thing to do. But I'm going to make a number of points. Firstly, we have to get to the bottom of what looks like having been very serious Pfizer abuse. We know that Pfizer warrants were obtained, which resulted in surveillance of Carter Page. Carter Page being a junior Trump campaign aide. He wasn't in fact even an aide because what he did, he did unpaid. He was some kind of volunteer who was loosely connected to the Trump campaign. Those Pfizer warrants were obtained in ways that all the indications are suggest were not were, did not result in proper disclosure of all the information to the Pfizer court. The Pfizer court was not informed about concerns about the reliability of Christopher Steele's dossier which was the basis of the whole investigation. And the Pfizer court was not informed about the role of Glenn Simpson or about the fact that the Christopher Steele dossier was paid for by the Hillary Clinton campaign. That already points the finger 
at some of the people you have identified. Who, who signed? Who, are who signed? Those, right. Who exactly? Who signed? McCabe, Comey, Rosenstein. Three of those people that you mentioned, they're already potentially in the firing line over this abuse. Indisputable and, fact. There are indis- signatures fact. on those documents, correct? No question about it. Now, bear in mind that misleading the court in that kind of way is a serious criminal offence. So already we're looking at one set of potential crimes. That's just one set of potential crimes. This, I think, explains why Michael Horowitz's report, Michael Horowitz is the inspector general of the FBI, has been held back. The reason it's been held back is that it clearly overlaps with John Durham's investigation. And of course, what Horowitz was looking at specifically was the issue of Pfizer abuse. So I predict that's going to be published very soon now, and we'll be getting indictments in that case. This is the Pfizer abuse case, very quickly. There are other issues, because the Pfizer case, abuse case that I've talked about relates specifically to Carter Page. There is a great deal of evidence that other people were placed under surveillance also. One of them, quite possibly, was George Papadopoulos. He thinks so. He thinks so. Again, there has to be concerns about Pfizer abuse there. There is another issue that comes up, and that is the use of all of these very destructive leaks in order to to undermine first the Trump campaign, then the Trump transition team, and then the Trump administration. So what are we looking at? Firstly, breaches of law, which says that the federal agencies of the United States should not interfere in elections. We know this was being discussed during the campaign itself. We know that people who were concerned about that, were over, uh, their concerns were overridden and the the, uh, intelligence community signed off a extraordinary memo or statement, a public statement in October 2016, whilst the election was underway, which clearly pointed at interference in the election. We know that the people behind that document were James Clapper and Brennan, two people you've just identified. We also know, we also know that there were leaks, leaks of classified information. Some of these leaks were used, for example, to engineer the the removal from office and the subsequent prosecution of Michael Flynn. But there were many other leaks also. Leaks of classified, leaking is a criminal offence in itself. Leaking of classified information is a very serious criminal offence. Leaking of classified information in order to engineer the removal of senior officials of the United States government. That is a still more serious offence. Now, who was involved in engineering Michael Flynn's dismissal? Sally Yates, Attorney General of the United States, Bre- uh, Brennan, possibly, because this was based on tape recorded information, the FBI, because one of the key events that brought about Flynn's uh, fall was the fact that he was interviewed by two a- FBI a- agents, one of whom, incidentally, was Peter Strzok. And that points again to Comey. Some more of the names that you have mentioned. And then, of course, and we don't know how far this investigation has gone. We come back, we come to what are perhaps the two most serious issues. The whole story of George Papadopoulos 
the business with um, the business with Mifsud, and we've seen how Barr and Durham went to Rome and are clearly exploring issues around Mifsud, the 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 way in which other provocateurs, Oxford professors, mysterious Turkish women were being thrown at uh, um, Papadopoulos. Australian diplomats. Australian diplomats, all kinds of things. That looks like a conspiracy to entrap Papadopoulos. And that does also point to possible offences being committed. Can I just say that points to Brennan, who was the head of the CIA, which seems to have been involved in all of these activities. And then, of course, there is perhaps potentially the single most explosive issue of all, which is the DNC server, the so-called DNC hack, if there was a hack, all that mysterious information about what was going on with the leaking of the emails from the DNC, which were, the, in, a, in a way, the big story around Russiagate. Now, all I will say about that, notice this, that... Donald Trump, in that now notorious discussion with Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, was talking about, seemed to be talking about the DNC server. We don't quite know what he meant by that, but that suggests that there is some kind of investigation going on, headed by Barr and Durham, which is looking at that issue also. Now, who does that point to? Well, it points to all the people on the DNC, possibly Hillary Clinton. You mentioned her name also. Now, I want to make it very clear. This is all speculation. Some of it, I think, is very well founded. I think the Pfizer, the Pfizer abuse cases clearly point, in my opinion, to criminal prosecutions. Um, other things, perhaps, a little more speculative, but not much. The leaking, for example, that was clearly criminal offences. Clearly some important people were involved. About the Mifsud affair, it's very interesting that Barr and Durham went to Rome. About the DNC hack, it's very interesting what Trump said to Zelensky. But there we, we are going further into the world of speculation. We have much to look forward to. <laughs> No, let's let's go into the world of speculation, <laughs> Alexander. Well, indeed, why not? <laughs> let's why let's not go Russia? a little bit. Let's go why a little bit. Russia gate, three years of speculation. So why shouldn't we engage in a little yeah, bit of let's, speculation? Let's go a little right. bit, but but all the more so since we admitted speculation and are careful to stick to facts. Right. That's where I, that's what I was going to say. Speculation, <laughs> but well grounded speculation. Okay, yeah. the FISA court, the, the FISA docs, and the warrants, and, and the FISA courts. I think is pretty solid from the fact that yeah. there are signatures. Yes. Okay, we have the signatures there. Yes. No one yes. can dispute that. Okay. I've got a lot of questions now to ask. So hopefully you can get quick answers and we won't go for like an hour because I got a lot of stuff that I want to ask you. The fact that Barr and Durham went to find Mifsud, that means there's a part of them that believe Papadopoulos, correct? Absolutely. Why else would they have gone to Rome? So they find I mean, his story credible, correct? It, it would seem so. Otherwise, I come back to this question. Why would they have gone to Rome? At least they find it credible enough to want to ask questions. If you follow the Papadopoulos storyline, then you need to speak to the government's of the United Kingdom, Australia, and Italy, correct? Absolutely. And we know for a fact that, that William Barr has asked the President of the United States, Donald Trump, to uh, ask the governments of these countries to um, assist with his investigation. We know that he said that to the Australian government. There's information that he sent it to the Italian government. Almost certainly he sent it to the British government, and of course, we know from the uh, uh, Zelensky Trump call that Trump said that to the Ukrainian government. So unquestionably, there there is a request being made for help from various foreign governments. In the last three months, Alexander, Trump has met with 
the UK leader, Boris Johnson. Boris correct? Johnson. Trump correct. has met with the Australian leader, correct? He hosted uh, him at correct. the White House. Correct. And they've spoken on the phone. Trump has met with the Italian leader who was in the Oval Office, I believe, just two weeks ago. Correct. Indeed. Exactly. Giuseppe Conte. He was in he was in the Oval Office, exactly as you said. And we also have a transcript with Trump and Zelensky. So we know pretty much exactly what Trump asked of Ukraine. Correct. Cor correct. Correct. Clearly. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me again that this is a serious investigation and that it's being taken forward and that Barr and Durham have concluded that there is a great deal, to, great many questions to ask and that this investigation is, be, is, is being conducted in a proper and thorough way. So um, the net is closing, if you like. OK, so Trump has had contact with the countries that played a major role in the Russiagate hoax. We know yes. that as well. There yes. was, I forgot the, the press conference that Barr gave, but I remember Rosenstein was standing right behind Barr. He looked very defeated, but he looked like he had accepted his role in the Justice Department, and it looked like he had ratted out everyone else. That's my opinion. I don't know if you, you you remember the conference that I'm talking about where, where Barr was, Barr had some very sharp replies to reporters and uh -oh. Rosenstein was kind of standing in back of him, just kind of, you know, he, he fell in line. Yeah, Do you I, I, think... I, I remember that conference okay. extremely well, if I may say. And can I just say the other thing, of course, was that Rosenstein very interestingly supported Barr's conclusions about the whole obstruction argument against Trump. That strongly points to my, to my mind to the fact that Rosenstein is now cooperating with Barr. That was my question. Doesn't that tell you that Rosenstein, who is, and you've always said it, a major player yeah. in the Russiagate hoax. Yeah. What does that tell you? He's playing along. Is it yes. in your experience? Do you believe that Rosenstein may have been the first person to actually tell Barr exactly what happened so that Barr can move forward with the full investigation that he's uh, he has going on right now with Durham. I, now that I can't know. I mean, I no, can't no, your know. Your opinion, because he was, it I seems think, like he was the first person to fall in line. It seems. I, I, I think, I think it is highly likely because they were clearly in contact with each other, uh, literally from the moment that Barr became attorney right. general. That's my point. I mean, yeah. I mean, Rosenstein after all was the deputy attorney general. So it's entirely logical that the two of them would have been working together. But, you know, we've been hearing a great deal about whistleblowers recently. There was a very interesting article a few weeks ago, which again didn't attract a great deal of attention, that all kinds of people across the intelligence community, genuine whistleblowers, let's be very clear about this, because this word whistleblower has been so misused by the Democrats and the media in the last few weeks, genuine whistleblowers have been coming forward and contacting uh, uh, Durham and have been providing him with all sorts of information. So if Rosenstein uh, um, has been cooperating with Barr, uh, he's not the only one, and he may have been the first one, but lots of others appear to have followed. Right, but he was a major. That's my point. There is oh, kind of saying he's, he is, he was he a major, a, major player he, in this. He is a pivotal figure. Firstly, he was the person who was obviously supervising, uh, um, supervising Mueller. Except, of course, as we know, he didn't really supervise Mueller. But the other thing is, I mean, he was absolutely deeply involved in the Pfizer in the Pfizer warrants against Carter Page. I mean, so much so that I personally think he should have recused himself because it seems to me the questions that that brought out uh, are, are, are so important. I mean, I, you know, it was inevitable that he would be asked questions eventually. All right. If Barr and Durham decide to really dig into the DNC server, is it a foregone conclusion that they're going to eventually have to look into Hillary Clinton. I mean, can you separate well, the DNC 
from Hillary no. Clinton. <laughs> No, you can't, because Hillary Clinton, through her campaign, was largely funding the DNC, or at least partially funding the DNC, and she herself admitted the fact. That's one of the things that came out in the DNC emails that WikiLeaks published. I mean, Hillary Clinton herself was complaining about the fact that she was having to largely fund or back fund or bankroll the DNC. So this is, this is in fact... Can I stress again, it is a matter of facts. We're not speculating about that now. Now, the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign, I think it's absolutely obvious. We're working incredibly closely together right through the 2016 election. And when I talk about the 2016 election, I mean the primaries also. If the DNC... Let us never forget, this is what the whole WikiLeaks... Debbie Wasserman uh, Schultz. Exactly. Yeah. That's what The whole thing was all about was the fact that they were helping Hillary Clinton to become the Democratic Party's candidate for the presidency of the United States. Now, the DNC and Hillary Clinton, which were working so closely together, were also closely involved in other things. And here I come back to Christopher Steele, and his dossier, which they were paying for, and which was being fed back through Bruce Orr and all kinds of other people into the FBI and the Justice Department into, in order to justify surveillance of the Trump campaign. I mean, that in itself is a serious thing. That begs many questions. It could, it could lead to questions about a potential conspiracy. I'm not saying there was one. I don't want to go beyond the facts, but you can certainly ask those questions, it seems to me. Okay. Uh, and of course, it, it, it begs all sorts of other questions also about how CrowdStrike and its report into the DNC hack was accepted in the way that it was. Bear in mind that it seems that CrowdStrike never actually completed the report something we've only discovered very recently. And, of course, the fact that the FBI and the Justice Department never sought access to the DNC servers. They based all their opinions, or at least they based all their publicly stated opinions, on a report by CrowdStrike paid for the, by the DNC and Hillary Clinton by extension, which was never completed. So, again, begs lots, lots of questions, and one asks why and how. Bear in mind, the person who was heading the Justice Department at that time, and who was heading, ultimately, was ultimately responsible for the FBI at that time, was Loretta Lynch, another of the names you mentioned. Right. And that leads me to my final two questions. And one of them revolves around Loretta Lynch's boss. And, and this question I'm going to ask you right now, Alexander, is related to the DNC and Hillary Clinton. Yeah. If you go down the path of DNC Hillary Clinton, like you said, you have to look at CrowdStrike. And if you look at CrowdStrike, you have to look at Ukraine. Yes. Ukraine impeachment inquiry is connected to this, you think? Well, absolutely, because, of course, can I just also remind you that it isn't just CrowdStrike that you're looking at. You're also looking at the fact that the Ukrainian embassy and various people in Ukraine were putting apparently together a black ledger in order to discredit Paul Manafort, who was at that time Donald Trump's uh, campaign head. And that was going on. We know that was going on. I mean, that's largely confirmed, not entirely confirmed, but largely confirmed. And it seems that there were people within the Ukrainian embassy who were quite openly talking about it. And it seems that Ukraine's head of the Nas uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau was openly has been openly talking about it also. So, yes, you look at Ukraine. Of course you do. Lots of the paths lead back to Ukraine. And that's why Donald Trump spoke to Zelensky right. over the phone. <laughs> right. So it shouldn't be a surprise that the Democrats have the secret Ukraine gate inquiry, impeachment inquiry. Should it be? 
Of, of course it's not a surprise. It's entirely predictable. Can I come back to what I have said right from the start of this bizarre Ukraine gate impeachment hoax that its clear and obvious purpose is to obstruct the progress of the Bar Durham investigation, which is looking at some of the things that were going on, many of the things that were going on in Ukraine. I'm not the only person to say that, by the way. Andrew McCarthy on National Review, a very able uh, uh, lawyer, a former federal prosecutor, has said it also. And I understand many other people are saying it. Just as Russiagate itself, in my, to my mind, was intended to distract attention away from the fact that members of the Trump administration, Trump campaign, were being surveyed for all kinds of phony reasons. So Ukraine Gate is an attempt to distract and draw attention away from the origins of Russia Gate and into the and the ongoing investigation that is taking place into that. Okay, final question, Alexander: Is this possible to have happened without Obama being in the know? Well. I have to say this. I cannot personally believe this. I mean, I, I want to make this very clear. I mean, I've got no actual evidence because Obama is one of these people who always manages to steer very clear of any apparent wrongdoing. We know that he was involved in some ways. We know that Brennan sent him this famous, mysterious uh, uh, um, envelope with all this information. Some of it appears to have been the Steele dossier. Some of it was this so-called Russian spy that the CIA was running in the Kremlin. Only it turns out that he wasn't actually working in the Kremlin and that he wasn't actually a very senior official after all. Uh, anyway, that seems to have passed Obama's desk. And Obama seems to have played some kind of a role in both authorizing investigations and to have given people like uh, Susan Rice and Samantha Power the the right or the, the green light to start um, unmasking people, which was in itself a terrible thing to do because all sorts of people were implicated in a Russian collusion story, which we now was untrue. So he certainly played a role. What role it was, I don't know. But I'm going to say one thing about Barack Obama. He's a highly intelligent man. He's a highly educated man. He studied uh, law in Columbia and in Harvard. He knows the way politics works in the United States. And he was the president of the United States. I cannot personally believe that he was ignorant of all the things that were going on. It beggars belief to me that this intelligent man didn't know many of the things that were happening. It seems to me either he knew about them and looked the other way or he quietly gave support to them but in a way that would not implicate himself. I'm going to just add one very last point about Obama, um, and it comes back to something that uh, a, a scandal, a mini scandal that happened over the course of Russiagate in March 2017, which many people have now forgotten. Donald Trump published a tweet in which he said that Barack Obama, Barack Obama, had had his telephone in Trump Tower, Trump Tower tape, wiretapped. And Obama came along and he gave what was referred to in the media as a denial. Except when you actually analysed it, it wasn't really a denial at all. He seemed to be throwing all the responsibility back to the Justice Department and it was a classic example of Obama engaging in what I would call a loyally non-denial denial. He's very clever at that kind of thing. And that does also make me think that he knew an awful lot more about what was what was going on than he likes to pretend now. All right. Alexander Mercurius, editor in chief of the Durant. Thank you very much. Hit that subscribe button, everybody. Hit that like button. Share the video with everybody you know. SoundCloud, iTunes, 
You can get an audio copy of this video and PayPal, Patreon, subscribe, star. Please donate to us and help our channel out. We really need your help. And also go to the Duran shop, pick up some magic mugs. Like the one I've got mm -hmm. here and some oh, magic we've got shirts. We've got different ones. You've got the Alpha Force one. I have the Lavrov one. But uh, so, I mean, you know, the, the brains and the brains and the brawn, the mind and the fist, if you like. But uh, uh, really amazing, amazing mugs, beautiful emblems, uh, uh, 15 ounces. They keep us both refreshed and invigorated. And they are great mugs just as our t-shirts are great. I'm with our Duran Eagles there, a double-headed eagle, 100% cotton, uh, extraordinarily elegant to, 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 you know, to be dressed in, incredibly comfortable to wear, perfect for all kinds of weather, 100% cotton, beautifully stitched, wonderfully made, and we don't just have short sleeve t-shirts like this. We have long sleeve t-shirts, we have polo neck shirts, we have hoodies, we have stickers, we have v-neck shirts, we have hats. Um, so what are you waiting for? Go to the Duran, help the Duran, buy yourself these great, fantastic things, which our competitors are trying desperately and failing dismally to copy. Alex will tell you how to do it. <laughs> You'll find the link for the Duran shop in the description in the description box down below <laughs> the Duranshop.com. Alexander Van Curry, thank you very much. Till next time, everybody, take care.